let's uh, go back to Burger Becky Heinemann. She is going to describe how she ported the Amiga version of Out of This World to the Apple IIGS and prove the naysayers that the 65C816 was powerful enough to do so. Rebecca? Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Um, yes or no? Yes. Uh, okay, good. All right, let's start this fun. Um, I'm Rebecca Ann Heinemann. I've been an Apple II programmer since the Apple II came into being around 1977. Um, before that, I did AIM 65 programming, which is an old Rockwell build-it-yourself 6502 computer. So I've known 6502 forever. Um, since then, um, we're going to fast forward now to 1992. Um, 19, was it 92 or 91? Anyways, around 1990, give or take, um, a new game came out from Delphine Software called um, Out of This World. It was already released in um, Europe uh, by Delphine Software, and Interplay wanted to release this game in the United States. One thing led to another. We got the rights and published the game on the Amiga and the Atari ST in the United States. Um, they had a programmer working on it for the IBM PC, but I took a look at the game and just offhandedly, because I am known to be a bitch, is that I said, hey, I could do that on the 2GS. Now, of course, um, after the room stopped laughing, I said, no, no, really, I could do that game at roughly a similar frame rate um, on a 2GS. It shouldn't be that difficult. And of course, they laughed at me again. And I said, challenge accepted. So I went ahead and snatched a copy of the source code, uh, went back into my office. And of course, the code was a little bit more challenging than I thought, mostly because it was written in 68,000 assembly code. It was, the engine itself was all pure assembly. But the game itself was written in this tokenized language that Eric Chahi created to write the game in, including the game's logic and the drawing. Everything was all done in the game so that you would actually, in the game, say, draw a line from here to here, draw this line to here to here, draw a polygon. Um, well, here's the fun part. When I was looking at Out of This World and I knew how the Amiga Blitter worked, everybody in the room thought, that the game was actually drawing true polygons. That is, if I drew a pentagram or a pentagon, it would just figure out all the, the, the uh, parts of the pentagon and draw it out. That's not how it worked. The game only drew trapezoids. The way it did it was that it would take a line segment here and a line segment here and just fill it, making a polygon piece. Then it would draw another one below that and another one below that. So every single shape you saw in Out of This World was drawn with trapezoids. Simple, line-drawn trapezoids. And the reason I knew this, because that is, a simp that is a way for the blitter to be easily set up to draw a solid polygon, because the blitter was designed to do trapezoids perfectly. So I just simply took the something like 80 lines of code that he had to, draw, to talk to the blitter, and it just wrote hand drawn assembly code, which I actually used for, get this, Task Times and Tone Town. And it was used again in uh, uh, Bard's Tale, Bard's Tale 1. I had line draw routines. And I just simply copied them, optimized them specifically for a um, trapezoid. And with that, the background was drawn for Out of This World. You know, the initial scene that looked like this. <laughs> now, what I'm holding here is an actual hand-drawn painting from the game Out of This World for the 3DO. But that scene shows up on my 2GS, of course, in simple polygons. Once that happened, then I found that all the code that drew the little guy, uh, Lester, that wasn't even done in polygons. It was actually done in X coordinates, just a list of start from top Y, X, 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 and then just drawing all those would draw um, Lester, the character. 
Um, so with that, um, use the same line drawing algorithm, except being fed from these lines, and it would then animate Lester himself, um, and also a lot of common shapes like the guns, some laser beams, um, laser beam effects and things like that. Uh, and of course this was done for optimizations and it gave it some, because on the blitter, it couldn't just do simple line polygons. It had to do every single line and that's what it did. Well, after spending two weeks in just literally locked in my um, office, I came up with a first prototype in which you can actually start playing the game just loads up, does the entire opening cinematic, would then start playing the game. Um, and then at that point, um, you know, you'd show up in the alternate world and then you'd start playing. Well, at this point in time, uh, the people at Airplay were wondering, what the hell is Becky doing? Because she's locked in her room and she's not actually doing her work <laughs> at the time which was, uh, I think it was Game Boy um, track meet, which that in of itself, I did an entire YouTube video. If you want to hear that horror story, just go to my YouTube channel, look for Burger Time, and you'll see something called Game Boy. Um, and essentially it was two weeks to me escaping from that nightmare. Um, so what happened next? I showed this proof of concept to the higher ups at Interplay who of course accused me of using hardware acceleration or I actually was running an Amiga or no, this is not possible. You are not running this on a 2GS. But I said, yes, I am running this on a 2GS. Bleh. Well, then that's when the idea came up of saying, hey, since the 65816 is the same as in the Super Nintendo, could you port this to the Super Nintendo? Which I said, yeah, it's not that hard. Um, just change the video drivers. Well, that led to a story in which the Super Nintendo version was um, born, which of course then gave, you know, it meant that the upper higher ups at Interplay didn't want me murdered for essentially wasting two weeks of my time working on a dead end project because it's, Sig uh, Sigwind into doing the game Out of This World for the Super Nintendo, which from their point of view, and rightfully so, um, Super Nintendo version of Out of This World would make a lot more money than, um, <laughs> let's see here, I saw a post here, let's see. Okay, um, yeah, I'll go answer those questions later. Um, what was happening, so because I did the Super Nintendo version, which then made money, um, they then, um, after, while I was working on the Super Nintendo version, I was also improving, like as I was learning different instruction streams using PEI and other tricks um, to be able to move polygon uh, information as humanly as fast as possible, you know, down to cycle counting. And at that point, I already knew the 60816, knowing every single cycle counting, every single problem um, of the chip um, and so forth, whether NVN works and how to use it, et cetera. Um, I, back engineered that all to, to, uh, to the 2GS because the Super Nintendo version and the 2GS version are the same version. I mean, the same, it's the same source code. In fact, the way the project builds is it actually builds both a 2GS and a Super Nintendo version at the same time. Um, it's just which driver set you link in. It, it's only in the linker phase as it determines which uh, libraries it includes to determine whether it's running on a Super Nintendo or a 2GS. Well, at this point in time, the 2GS market was all but dead. So there was really no point in finishing out of this world for the 2GS only because other than me giving it away, what, how, who's gonna see the fruits of my labor? Um, and of course I couldn't give this game away because it was copyright Delphine. And of course, even though the 2GS market was dying, it wasn't dead yet at the time. Well. There was a company out there called the Big Red Computer Club. They were going around buying up inventory of Apple II GS games and then selling it in a, you know, basically the equivalent of a mail order online store. And people were buying up old copies of games. 
Um, and in some cases, they got the rights to things like um, the Activision's Infocom games and repackaged it and made brand new products out of it. Well, I contacted them and said, hey, I got this game that's almost finished. Um, well, are you be interested in selling it? And of course, at that point, the uh, Big Red Computer Club was like, Give me, give me, give me. You know, you've seen the scene where you would see uh, Fry from Futurama going, shut up and take my money. Um, and that's pretty much what they were saying to me. So I got him in touch with, uh, with Interplay, who in turn, um, the head honcho at Interplay was like laughing, saying, who in the hell wants a 2GS game? Because he really wasn't a fan of the 2GS. Um, so he then said, fine, you have to buy 1,000 copies at our regular wholesale price, which at the time was, I think, like $35 a copy or something, $25 to $35 a copy. And then, and only then, will Interplay press the discs and, and make the packages and send them off to the Big Red Computer Club. And last but not least, no backseas. You write that check, and uh, you broke it, you bought it. Well, Big Red wrote the check, much to um, you know Interplay's, like, what? So at that point, I had someone come up to my room and go, um, we need to officially QA this game because we have an order for a thousand copies. <laughs> so like, oh, cool. And that's when I actually finished up all the coding, the main coding of the game, which is essentially what we call in the industry beta, in which the game's feature complete. It should ship but we really need to go through QA, you know, basically people playing the game. Unlike what we do today, which is when the game's beta, you put it up on Steam, and when people complain, then you fix the bugs. We didn't have that luxury back then. So I had two of my friends at Interplay who were also 2GS fanatics. We were kind of like a little team, a sub-team within Interplay. We started playing the game, and we came up with a problem. Um, while you could play the game with the joystick, most people were going to play with the keyboard. The 2GS version uh, of the keyboard driver, uh, the way you're supposed to read the keys, is that while keys like control, caps lock, shift, the, the, what we call the control keys, those you can read by bits, whether they're up or down at any time, which makes great for fire and uh, duck and so forth. But the ASD, um, the AWSD keys, the ones you use to go left, right, up, and down, you can only press one at a time. And that meant that because the way the game works, you had to be able to be running and then have the ability to jump at the same time. That was making the game not very fun. So at that point, I remembered that I did some stuff with the eight Apple desktop bus because I was doing peripherals for another company. Um, and I remember that there was a thing called what's known as two key rollover. Now, two key rollover is a technique in which when you do your keyboard here, you could press one key and it can monitor it. And then, you know, going down and up, down and up. But if you press two, it can still monitor both of them. Now, if you hit three, the uh, keyboard would tell you to go jump in a lake. Apple Desktop Bus, which is what was used in the Apple II, had two key rollover. The problem was how to tap into that. Put on my little uh, thinking cap, pulled out the books for the ADB. Then I reverse engineered the ADB ROM and the um, actual firmware that's inside of the Apple IIGS uh, uh, ADB microcontroller. Um, I then found out that, hey, if you call certain ADB key commands and just read the raw stream coming in from the keyboard and don't even look at the Apple II uh, keyboard um, the keyboard port, just totally ignore it. And every now and then just clear it out just to make sure that you know, you're know you not uh, piling up information within the firmware. I can then, by reading in the ADB keyboard and um, processing it manually, well, we, now we're doing that today in direct, uh, direct input and so forth. I could then read two keys on the keyboard and know which ones are going up and down, even out of sequence. Like you could press A, then W, and then let go of W, and I still know you're pressing A, and then let go of A. 
once I redid the keyboard input to use ADB streaming, the game was now perfectly playable. Uh, this code was recycled in Wolfenstein 3D for the 2GS. It's using the exact same code straight out of Out of This World, which is, again, why um, both Out of This World and Wolfenstein 3D are very um, fun experiences on the keyboard because I could actually read two keys and monitor them completely and independently on the 2GS. So once that was solved, and then me and the guys over there were saying, this game is good. We then packaged it up, sent it off to Duplication, who then, true to Interplay's word, they manufactured a thousand copies in the same manufacturing process line we do all the other games. So it came in a box, manuals, stickers, everything. And then they shipped it off to the Big Red Computer Club, and uh, my boss was actually laughing. Laughing, thinking that Big Red Computer Club just might sell 100 copies, and then that would be the end of it, and so forth. And then two months later, he comes into my office and goes, um, I don't know what's going on, but they just reordered. And they ordered another 1,000 copies. <laughs> To, of course, from Interplay's point of view, and that was nearly pure profit because it was just, you know, just run another copy of a thousand stuff of, you know, cookie cutter um, packaging. And we shipped it off to uh, Big Red Computer Club, which they eventually did sell out as well. But at that point, by the time they sold out, they were already like uh, three years down the road when Big Red was sh kind of shutting down. Um, but at that point, um, Out of This World was a game which became technically the last commercially available, um, commercially produced um, video game for the Apple IIGS, as far as I'm aware. I mean, at least from a major company. I know small independent developers made a couple more. Heck, I released uh, Ultima 1 later on and so forth um, through VTES. But the first game that was released on the 2GS was Task Times and Tone Town. So I have the dubious honor of being the person who made the first and last uh, commercially produced game from a major publisher um, on the 2GS. I don't know what kind of honor that is, but there you go. Um, let me go ahead and start asking, uh, let me, since I'm, there's going to be a lot of questions here, I'm going to go ahead and start scrolling back and start seeing um, if anybody has questions here. Um, yes, comment. Thank you for this. Uh, from Karmic. Uh, thank you for this and well for the fantastic 2GS titles through the years. Question Will there be any announcement this weekend regarding the proposed Knox Arcarnist GS port? Um, well, all I can say is I'm doing it. Um, any specifics, you may want to speak to the uh, Mark. Um, of the Knox team. He's the one who's going to be making all the formal things. Um, what I can acknowledge is, yes, I am doing the actual port. Um, the art will be upgraded. Imagine, to give you a, a, a setting the bar, I'm going to do to it what I did to Ultima, in which there's going to be newer graphics, beautiful music, it's probably in this case, I'm just going to take the Mockingboard music, but have it more, uh, more arranged and probably more instruments. Um, but it will be a true 2GS title. Uh, next one, next uh, adventure, Red App, Red Big Red Apple Club originally until, yeah, um, yeah, but it's Big Red Computer Club. The question is, uh, the Big Red Apple Club originally until Apple laid heavy onto them. Yeah, even now, Apple's kind of weird. Um, I know there's a company called MacPlay that when they started publishing on the Apple Store, um, the Apple Store didn't really appreciate that their company's name was MacPlay. Um, so they had to change their name for the Apple Store, despite the fact that MacPlay has been in business for at least 10 years before the Apple Store existed. Um, let's see. Public beta testing. Real programmers had to make sure all it worked before it went out. That's something I actually miss. In fact, that's an, that's an interesting antidote is the fact that um, I remember back early days of Interplay, we had a huge group of people whose job it was was to play test the game from start to finish to make sure there was no bugs because once we shipped the game, there was no backsies. 
Whereas today, I've been to numerous AAA studios and they don't have a QA department other than maybe a cursory one whose job is to make sure that the game doesn't uh, have obvious bugs, but otherwise it's really everybody's playing the game is the beta testers, which is kind of sad. Um, Kat asks, how did you dump the ADB controller ROM? Actually, Apple helped that. In the ADB toolbox, there's an actual function called uh, get con ADB controller memory. And you give it an address. It just so happens that they didn't bounce check it. So in other words, would you give it, a, they expected you just to use the, that function to read just the microcontroller's RAM. Well, if you happen to point it to where the ROM locates, you can, you can read that too. So it was a big, huge security hole, but you know what? It helped me dump the ROM, and then I had to get a manual for the um, Mashutsuda 570 microprocessor in order to learn how to read its assembly because it wasn't 6502. It was a totally different 8-bit instruction set. But so I had to learn a whole new instruction set as well as reverse engineering the ROM, but I was crazy. It still am, to be honest. Okay, from, um, I can't really read, Jer, or something like that. Can we crowdsource Rebecca to build a totally new game from the crowd, ground up? Um, yeah, support my Patreon. <laughs> uh, next, the story is gold. Um, this talk is worth taking, t taking off work today. Uh, what, year was it what year was released the last game on the 2GS? I think it was 1992, but I probably am wrong. Um, but I know it was around the early 90s was when it was saying. Oh, uh, David Fetz asked, how many lines of code was Out of This World? Okay, um, Out of This World was about um, 4,000 lines of 68,000 assembly, about 6,000 lines of 6502, mostly because there was like compiled shaders. So it's really like this long function that just drew one shape kind of stuff. Um, and then of course, something like about 70 to 100,000 lines of the language, which, you was which basically was the game all the polygons all the scripting and stuff like that um because there was no data in the game of polygons except for those mini sprites that were just uh x coordinates um the game itself was you know set x to this set the uh, this variable to y draw this trapezoid uh there you go okay awesome algas will compose okay Aren't there plenty of other GS titles that Becky started that she's yet to finish? Um, yeah, I have on my hard drive in, incomplete versions of Sim City for the 2GS, Bard's Tale 3, it just needs art. Um, let's see, what was the other one that wasn't done yet? Um, Ultima 2, Ultima 2 also needs the art. Um, then there was a Wasteland, that was also unfinished. Um, the game, the code's done, but I have to do all the... Um, um, art, and because the problem is I'm a, I'm a programmer, I'm not an artist. Um, so most of the things are really held back because of art, although Wasteland probably needs debugging and stuff like that. Um, let's see here, am I out of time? Let's see here. Uh, oh, get, no, not out of time yet. Okay, let me go back to the end. Uh, Carmack says, I want to hear Becky use the fill mode. Okay, I want to hear if Becky tried to use the fill mode on the 2GS. I don't know if it was helpful as people would like, but it seemed like a, treat, a use could be found. Okay, um, one of my first attempts to do out of this world was with fill mode because I thought, oh, I just have the line. All I have to do is just do a start at this end and this uh, at, at the, the other end. The problem was, was that in order for me to go from frame to frame with fill mode, I had to also, let's say this frame looks like this, but the next frame it's over here. Well, I mean, for me to do that, I would have to redraw this frame here, then erase this, and then I had to move this, and it caused so much flickering um, because I really didn't want to lock it to vertical blank um, in order for me to draw with fill mode. And the extra code I had to do in order for it to remember what the state of the last frame was versus the new frame, et cetera, that it turned out to be far more trouble than it's worth. Plus, the fill mode only really gave me optimizations on scenes in which it had a large area of the screen that had one big solid area of fill. But many parts of the game, um, there were places that had a lot of detail 
especially ones in which the game would draw a trapezoid here first, then would draw details on top of that, and then draw details over here, which of course with fill mode means that I would draw a purple triangle, here, this trapezoid here, but then would do a blue one here, which would then cause the black to go over there. So it just, it was one of those where after spending like three or four days trying to make it work, it was one where I just went for the simplest uh, technique, which was just draw the whole thing. And in order to get the, um, the game to draw without any physical breaks was that I had to draw the entire screen on bank zero using direct page manipulation. And then using that, I would use a high speed through PEI um, refresh by just reading and writing the same memory to essentially upload it to the video buffer. And that's a technique that was also used in Wolfenstein 3D GS as well as many, uh, several other games. I think I used that as well on, um, gosh, what was the Sims? No, SimCity was a total windowed app. Um, and I know Crystal Quest was using XOR techniques. Um, but, oh, um, yeah, there was that other game that I can't talk about um, that was using it. But the, the whole thing was that it was just draw the screen on zero pay, on bank zero, fold the memory in so that by reading in bank zero, I could write it back to bank zero or actually bank one, and then it would uh, refresh it to the video display. And at that point, it drew just fine. And in fact, it's kind of like what the Super Nintendo does. I, I drew it into an off-screen buffer, and then I had a very high-speed piece of code blasted into the um, VRAM of the Super Nintendo. So it's kind of like the, the same technique. Um, let's see here. Um, from the Quinn, fill mode is an evil siren. I tried to build my terrain engine for my current game with it. It ended up not being worth the trouble. It really seems like a good idea, but it never being so. Yeah, I mean, I've yet to find a way other than Tumbles of Armageddon. I think that's the only game I've ever seen that used fill mode in a effective way. But um, I mean, I did try, um, but it was just the having to remember what it was versus what it should be and then upload it to the screen. It's like, ugh. Um, someone asked, have you seen the Bard's Tale Wasteland 1 remasters? They're very well done by Inexa. Well, I worked on the Bard's Tale 1. Um, I was one of the Bard's Tale 1 remaster. In fact, the Bard's Tale 1, 2, and 3 remastered for Inexile. And in Wasteland 1, I was actually a consultant because I was the only one who knew the code. And I went in. There were many, many Skype calls with, um, was it Chrome? Um, as well, they also took the remastered version that I did originally, um, and they used that entire code base. I gave them the whole code base, and they used that as the foundation. Um, let's see here. Um, hearing the term manipulate from Burger Becky. Well, yeah, that's from Tony Diaz. Let's see. Anyone else here? Um, from Kirk. Will there be a SNES version of Nox Ar Arcanus since you're doing the 2GS version? My answer is, what well, I don't see why not. It's just the problem is the controllers. Um, you know, Nox Arcanist is kind of like Bard's Tale. It's where the whole point of the game is using the keyboard to issue numerous commands. And how do you translate that to a little controller? That's, um, that's going to be the challenge. Um, from Bo, I can't read the rest. What does SimCity need to finish? Um, there's some code optimizations need to do because the problem with SimCity for the 2GS is that unless you're running with an accelerator, um, the code to handle um, the code to handle the actual simulation of the city um, needed to be time sliced, and I needed to do some other tricks in order to be able to keep it so it's not pausing the game. Um, there, that was the main problem because the original code was done using a cooperative multitasking uh, in 68K on the Mac. And I would have had to do something similar to that for the 2GS version. But it's like, and also, of course, you know, hopefully C compilers are a lot better because uh, SimCity for the 2GS, the main logic was written in uh, C and which compiled under Orca C. Um, I only have a few minutes left, so let me see if there's any more questions last uh, before I have to um, move on for the next person. Um, someone here on Twitch was asking, oh, Catacombs Abyss. Um, I don't know if you knew, but um, I ported one of the Catacombs games to the 2GS for um, SoftDisk. Um, I know it was released a while ago. I mean, I have the code for all the other games too, and I can easily port those as well. Um, 
Catacombs Abyss, Catacombs of Armageddon are Wolfenstein 3D-like games uh, that were done by, originally by id Software um, for Softdisk, and, or maybe they were done for Soft. I don't remember. That's really John Carmack's answer. But uh, I ended up getting the uh, code base so I could port them over to the 2GS. Anyways, um, this is going to be concluding my talk. I'm sorry I can't really show any diagrams because I broke my leg. But again, here's the art I just wanted to show again. So we can close with this. Again, this is for the 3DO version. And that's hang that was hanging on my wall. I'm going to put it right back. But that's the actual artwork that was used for the game. Um, so um, I'm going to yield my time. <laughs> Thank you, that was fascinating. We have one last question from John Carmack. How yes. many copies of high quality games like this actually moved to the GS at this point? Um, high, well, like what games? You mean uh, like uh, t today or back then? Back then, uh, how many games like Out of This World moved to the 2GS? Oh, there was about uh, at least 100 games. Because uh, I know uh, Accolade released a bunch, EA did a bunch. Um, Activision, so forth. I mean, Past Times in Tone Town was done through Activision, um, but there's at least a hundred games that were ported over to the 2GS. I mean, um, and of course, some came later, like Rastan, um, but it's easily over a hundred, um, probably bordering on 200. And then the rest are all indie games that some of them were as good as AAA titles. Thank you. Next up.